Okay, so I'm going to read a little from that, and then um, and then Tusker, your question will perfect perfectly come out of that intro. Um, so this is, this I found really fascinating, and we'll we'll come back to this because the book does. Uh, the biggest banks, the four super major oil companies, and the Silicon Valley tech giants all incarnate a powerful globally oriented liberal faction that opposes him. Him meaning Trump. They seek to make the USA more racially inclusive and to destabilize anti-imperialist countries in the name of spreading human rights. They favor a more social democratic model, perhaps involving universal basic income to stabilize U.S. society as the population is transitioned to lower living standards across the board. They favor reduction of consumption in the name of fighting global warming and further integrating the U.S. economy into a global market. While Trump's faction focuses on increasing its short-term profits, the globalist faction that Trump decries focuses on maintaining stability while gradually implementing long-term goals. Pouring billions of dollars into research and social engineering, the upper faction of U.S. capital favors gradually and carefully reducing living standards, eliminating anti-imperialist governments around the world, transitioning to a more open global economy, normalizing police state repression in everyday life, and reducing the human population. All right, so Tusker, your question? Uh, yeah, sure. So in that uh, third chapter, you mentioned that in reality, what we're actually experiencing in politics is really more of a fight at the top and it's between different factions and that some of those factions are trying to hold off one faction that they see is particularly particularly dangerous and so i'm kind of wondering what's the nature of that faction that they want to kind of keep out of power what's its class interests and how is it so dangerous for ordinary working people well you know, there's a lot written about this. I certainly didn't develop this understanding. Um, you know, there's a very good book called The Rich and the Ultra Rich by Ferdinand Lundberg that I think was written in the 1930s. And it talked about, you know, who was supporting Roosevelt and who was opposing him. Uh, and then Carol Quigley, who was the mentor of Bill Clinton, he wrote a very good book called The Anglo-American Establishment. And he wrote a much longer book called Tragedy and Hope, kind of making this understanding. Uh, and then later you, you have, you know, a very good book that I often reference called The Yankee and Cowboy War by Carl Oglesby. And in the early 60s and in the 70s, a number of people in the United States became aware of the fact that among the American rich, there were two factions. Carl Oglesby calls them the Yankees and the Cowboys. But Carol Quigley spoke of the Anglo-American establishment. Uh, I think some of the LaRouche people, they talked about the British Empire, et cetera, uh, or the Rockefeller Republicans or whatever. But there is a faction among the rich and powerful in the United States that is more concerned with social engineering and staying at the top in the long run than they are with short-term profits. And people trace it back to the, uh, the, you know, the round table group established by the will of Cecil Rhodes, uh, who was, you know, it's Rhodesia. And Zimbabwe used to be Rhodesia, is the British colonialist. Um, and that there, there is a faction of the ultra-rich that have very much been interested in how do we stay at the top permanently and how do we impose a lot of control to make sure we don't have upheavals and revolutions and uprisings? And if that means that we have to spend a lot of money in the short term in order to do it, that's fine. Uh, but it's better to have stability so that we stay at the top indefinitely than it is to just have our profits shoot up in the short term. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can go back to, you know, the Roosevelt administration. It was pretty clear that Roosevelt, uh, he was aligned with the Rockefeller family. He was aligned with some wealthy people, but the National Association of Manufacturers very much opposed him because he supported unions in the factories and he passed, uh, you know, social security and unemployment insurance and that they saw him as cutting into their profits, whereas there were some more strategic or oriented of the, of the elite uh, who, who had a different orientation. And this is a push and pull. And after the Second World War, the military industrial complex really exploded. The US government was spending so much on bombs and tanks and weapons that gave a boost to these lower level capitalists who were in on that. 
And they were very anti-communist already because they didn't like labor unions, et cetera. But now they were making lots of money with tanks and bombs and weapons. So what we call the right wing now, uh, the John Birch Society, Barry Goldwater, et cetera, what we call the right wing goes back. It's those lower level capitalists that weren't you know, on board with this overall social engineering agenda that the ultra rich might have. Um, and I think, you know, you can interpret the political crisis of the 60s and 70s as as this disagreement. But, um, you know, by the 80s, the Soviet Union was getting ready to fall. U.S. society was restabilizing. And Ronald Reagan famously said, we're all friends after six o'clock, meaning the fight was over. Right. In the 80s and 90s, things were pretty normal. But after the financial crisis of 2008, the fight reopened and that, you uh, you know, many people have commented that Obama is a student of Zbigniew Brzezinski. He studied at Columbia University. And the people that really haven't had the upper hand in American politics since the Carter administration got power back under Barack Obama. Uh, and Donald Trump was opposing them. And those folks have picked Kamala Harris. And that, you know, again, these are, again, all when you talk about class interests, these are all capitalists. These are all people that sit at the top of a global imperialist system, but they have different goals and they're invested in different countries. I mean, a lot of it just gets back to the fact Russia is an oil exporting country and the Rockefellers and the DuPonts, they're all tied into oil. Uh, whereas a lot of these lower level capitalists, they're manufacturers. And uh, what country is a big manufacturing is the, the, you know, the factory of the world, China. So, you know, industrial manufacturers don't like China. Oil bankers don't like Russia. They both don't like them both, but there's a difference in agendas. Well, you know, one thing that I think changed since you wrote it in 2020 is you identify Silicon Valley as kind of being a block with that Rockefeller globalist group. And now there's kind of been this split where you have the the Elon tech people, the Peter Thiel people, the J.D. Vance's going over to the lower capital, even though they're quite wealthy, Elon, the wealthiest person in the world. So that that fact that Silicon Valley faction seems to have split since you wrote this. Well, the Silicon Valley was created by American intelligence, and there is no question about that. That's widely acknowledged. I think, you know, Al Gore, he got attacked when he was running for president because he said, I invented the Internet or was misquoted as saying that. And what he was referring to was the fact that it was a decision by the American government that this was something they could do. Uh, they could, uh, you know, invest a lot of money in computers and make the United States the center of the computer revolution. And the Soviet Union, even though they had amazing breakthroughs in computers, they were the first people in outer space, they developed their own home computer system, they just didn't have the resources to invest in it uh, the same way the United States did. And so, you know, you can read about how the NSA and the CIA and other intelligence agencies were very key in creating Microsoft and Google and Amazon and IBM and all the corporations that we now identify as Silicon Valley. And that, you know, that that, you know, late 70s, early 80s explosion in computer technology that put the United States at the center of that. Uh, it actually matches what was advocated by Zbigniew Brzezinski. He as far back as 1970, he wrote a book about the technotronic era and how control of information was how the world could be, quote, Americanized. Um, and so this is what those folks have always wanted. Now, what I find to be very interesting, you know, I talked about how Al Gore, you know, he said, you know, we invented the Internet. I invented the Internet. What's interesting is that Al Gore also had a spiritual advisor uh, who was like his psychic. Uh, and her name was Marilyn Ferguson. And he paid her lots of money. And she came over and did readings, et cetera, for the Gore family. And Marilyn Ferguson, you can read all about her. Her big book is called The Aquarian Conspiracy. And it was a best-selling book in the 1980s, all yeah, about how there was, a big, there was a big revolution coming. And it wasn't pro-communist or anti-communist. It was just about human awakening and human enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. And the world was going to get back into balance with Mother Nature. And we were going to get overpopulation under control and... Yeah, you look at that, that's some scary stuff, and that she's linked to, and she praises endlessly in that book, the Stanford Research Institute, which we know it was ground zero of a lot of this CIA programs uh, involving MKUltra and like weird research they did into psychics and mind control and all of that. And that was, that was where Marilyn Ferguson came out of. So it's not surprising that she would be the one trusted enough to be the psychic advisor of Al Gore. But Al Gore is also talking about how, you know, they invented the internet and they very much tried to have the U.S. government facilitate the rise of these corporations. And I think that's that's important to discuss as well. And that's where Silicon Valley came from. But 
let's be real. Silicon Valley has a lot of self-made men in it. It has a lot of libertarians in it, right? Um, right. You know, and so it, the personality of your average Silicon Valley tech bro is not the same as the overall agenda of the people who own the big tech monopolies. I think that's the distinction that needs to be made. Please clap. Yeah.